All right. We're going to go ahead and pray for Carl. Lord, <laughs> every good and perfect gift comes from you. And Carl is one of those gifts. He really is. Lord, I thank you for him. I thank you for all that you've done in his life. And I, I pray, God, that as he speaks this morning, that he would clearly speak the word that you've given him on his heart. Lord, that you would empower the words as they go out. Lord, that we would be changed through the hearing of your word. Amen. 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 I don't know why Don would mock me before I'm going to speak. <laughs> what can you expect? Um, okay, this, I'm going to adjust this mic so that's Okay, um, I have no boy. I have no anointing right now for mocking Don. Darn it. <laughs> he did he did mention my clothes and, and you would if you've been around here for a while, you would know this that I could care less about clothes. I what, what I wear. So uh, this morning is just an accident. It's what I had, it's what was clean. Um, and I don't have socks on. So, I, uh, anyway, I want to put up on the screen uh, a quote that I saw this week, and uh, it just really intrigued me. Not that, the quote before that. <laughs> the quote that you had up there. That one. Uh, what we call revival, the New Testament calls Christianity. Amen. There is, there is a big difference between being a follower of Christ, being a Christian, and the Christianity that we, that we s tolerate, facilitate, cultivate in our world today. Um, there's a, a guy, one of my favorite preachers, he was talking at some big thing, and he said, you know, if Jesus and I had a church in the same town, mine would be bigger. Because I know all the right things to say, all the right things to do to attract people. And if you've ever read anything about Jesus or followed his teachings, and uh, you'll see that he really wasn't into saying what people wanted to hear. Um, he would say quite rude things. Uh, I mean, if I was one of his apostles and he stared me in the face and said, get thee behind me, Satan, I'd be offended for the next year and a half, you know? Uh, and, and we know that in John 6, he, he said, if you want to follow me, that you'll, you'll eat my flesh and drink my blood. And people left in large numbers, quit following him. Uh, Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you, you must deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow me daily. But that's not really what we promote and facilitate today's, in today's world and culture. We, we, we facilitate consumerism. Um, we, we try to attract people. That, that's what we call an attractional model in the church. And so we do all the right things and, and create the right settings so that people will be attracted to us. And, um, you know, it's not something I'm terribly interested in as a pastor, as a pastor who's rapidly growing older. Praise God. <laughs> not quite sure what that means. Uh, but, uh, the first part. I, um, I've been, um, you know, this last week I got to see a, a guy that I knew, he was my junior high pastor. And he used to come to my door at my, my, my apartment where we lived, and he'd knock on my window at six in the morning. And he'd get me up, he'd take me out, and would go running, and then would sit down and he taught me how to study the Bible for myself. And uh, what a great gift. And, uh, and he's still in my life after all these years. He's 75 and I'm 62. And I sat across from the table from him and I thought, this is so cool. 
It's just so cool. And he's actually going to come and meet with Don and I this week and spend some time together. Tomorrow I'll spend some time with um, Carol Wimber, John Wimber's widow. And, and the thing for me, that the context of all that is that, that I've, I've just never been into exotic Christianity. Christianity that's, that's made for uh, people, you know, which scratches every itch. I, I really buy into this idea of being devoted followers of Jesus and everything in our life being affected by our relationship with him. Everything. Um, and so I, and I pray for this church and I prayed this last week, uh, just several times. I said, Lord, help us to become the kind of church that you'd want to go to, that you'd be happy with, that you'd be pleased of, in being a part of, you know, a church that, that cares for the poor, a church that loves and cares for one another. All that good stuff. Uh, can you put up the other quote, the C.S. Lewis quote? C.S. Lewis said, um, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Yeah, wow. When a person has been affected by the gospel, and we're going to talk about the gospel today. It affects every single aspect, every single area of one's life. It affects my sex life. It affects my, how I handle my money. It affects how I spend my time. It affects how I see other people. It affects everything. It affects all my viewpoints about life. And I, I do think that here in the U.S., I think it's very, very, very challenging to be a follower of Jesus. I think we have so many things at our fingertips that satisfy and please us and distract us and undermine our devotion, our complete and total devotion to Jesus and his ways. I th so, you know, we think of people in... in countries being persecuted, and we think of them having it, it tough, and they certainly do. But I think we, in many ways, have it more, we, it's much more difficult for us, because we've, we've got everything in the world competing against our devotion to Jesus. Everything in the world undermining our commitment and our submission to him. Uh, so I wanna talk about the gospel this morning, talk about what it is, and, uh, I'm going to start with Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for, for the gospel of God. Set apart for the gospel of God. Anyone who has faith in Jesus has been set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who has his earthly life, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through him we've received grace, and in Paul's case, apostleship, to call all Gentiles to obedience uh, that comes from faith in his namesake. And you are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Christ. The gospel breaks down this way. Christ, God, came from heaven. Came from heaven. Didn't hold on to his godness. Came to earth and humbled himself and became a man. And became, as he lived his life, he became the communication of God to you and I. And, and as, we were, as we were worshiping, the thought came to me that now you and I, are the communication of God to the world that we live in. It's pretty heavy. Mm. He lived a sinless life. And he, and he went through everything. Isaiah 53 tells us all the things that he would go through. Uh, the, the, the abandonment, you know, the, the shame, the, the mocking, the, the brutality, uh, all of the, he, he, Jesus even had unanswered prayer. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. 
he got a glimpse into hell. And he said, if there's any other way, and God was silent. So he, yeah, have you ever experienced silence? Have you ever experienced shame? Have you ever experienced being all alone? Well, guess what? Jesus experienced all those things for you and I. That's part of, that's part of us embracing and knowing the gospel. It's applying the gospel to our loneliness. Yeah. It's applying the gospel to our, to our, for our shame, yeah. our brokenness. We, that's what we do. We, that's how we get through life, is we, we, we take it and we appropriate that which was, was appropriated for us. That's how we live. That's why we live in a world that's in complete, in total contrast and conflict with the kingdom of God by embracing fully the cross and what it meant. So he lived a sinless life for sinful people. And he died a sinner's death to reconcile us to God. And then he ascended to heaven and sent his spirit so that we would not be The gospel is overwhelming. He sent a spirit so that we would not be orphans. We would not be fatherless. And he rose from the dead to empower us to live this life. And the, the most incredible and important thing for us to understand is that he is going to return and complete this whole picture. That's the blessed hope that we, that we hold near and dear. That's what gets us through, is that this isn't it. This is not it. It is about to come. And he'll reconcile all accounts at that time. And that's what we, we need so much. It's what C.S. Lewis wrote. We need so much for our, our viewpoint to be to be influenced and impacted by eternity. That everything that we go through here is temporary. Everything that we go through here is a moment in time. But when you're going through it, it's hard to, hard to sometimes see that, huh? Mm -hmm. When you're in pain. That's why we go to him when we're in pain. Because he suffered incredible pain. Paul said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Uh, my mentor and friend, John Wimber, used to say, the way in is the way on. But you know what? That's too simple for us. It's not complex enough. There's not enough for us to, to do in that equation. Because that equation, we do nothing but to believe. And that's the first characteristic of the gospel I'm going to talk about. Is that, number one, it's simple. It's simple. Think of the thief on the cross. He never tithed. He never attended a home group. He never went out and witnessed, you know. He just believed. And Jesus said, from this day forward, you'll be with me in paradise. And, and you know that, I'm telling you, that never changes. There is nothing that you can do to add to the gospel. Now, do we change? Do we, do we begin to live differently? Yes, if we've been impacted, penetrated, you know, by the gospel, it'll change the way that we see everything. It'll change the way that we see our brothers and sisters in Christ. If we've been impacted by the gospel, if I truly understand its, its magnitude and, and its, its breadth and depth, then I won't ever be surprised by anything you do that is sinful. I won't ever be offended by that. 
Because I know that there's nothing I've done to be righteous before God except for receive the Son. And so, you know, grace does teach us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, but it's grace, it's not us. So I don't have a right to point my finger at you and click my tongue and say, there, there. I've, I've got the right to embrace you right where you're at, just as Jesus embraced me right where I'm at. And that's what's changing me, is his embrace. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians, he said, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved by it, it's the power of God. <clears throat> For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. Where's the wise person? Where's the teacher of the law? Where's the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand a sign, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Think of the religions of the world and philosophies of the world. What, in, what, in what religion is their hero crucified? It's just crazy. It's just crazy by our standards. But God used it to reveal the hearts of men and women. But to those he's called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than any human strength. Another aspect of the gospel is that it's absolute, and it lacks ambiguity. This is this is the hardest thing to swallow in our relativistic, pluralistic culture. You know, it, relativism is we're comparing this to that, this to that. But when you're comparing Jesus to, to another religious philosophy, it's, you're not, it's not apples to apples, it's apples to turnips. Um, it's, uh, Jesus didn't claim to be, he was not ambiguous about who he was. He said this, right? Is it, does this resonate well in our culture, pluralistic culture? No. I am the way. I am the truth. I am I'm the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> I have to say it in rhythm. Uh, and <laughs> to the Father. And nobody comes to the Father except through the Son. That is, that is what we believe. That is what we stand in. Does it sound intolerant? Does it sound, in, in the culture that we live in, does it sound like, you know, that we're, that we're like building ourselves up and that everybody else is stupid? No. But it is what Jesus said, and it is what we stand upon. The gospel lacks ambiguity, and that's why it's so offensive. And it's even more offensive in a culture that... Um, That's so much diversity. If you declare, in Romans 10 it says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the gospel. If you declare with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ, you will be saved. And you'll be saved from a Christless, godless eternity. That is, there is a consequence for not believing, and the Bible talks about it. And it's not a pretty picture. Not something we talk about a lot, is it? And it makes the room even quieter. But God said, if you don't believe in my son, you will not enter my presence. He also said, but at the name of Jesus, no other name. In the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he's the Son of God to the glory of the Father, that he's Lord. Scripture says that anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same 
Lord is Lord of all, richly blessed. Let me skip that. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Another aspect of the gospel is it's scandalous. It's scandalous because it, it, it introduces the grace of God to us. Jesus came full of grace and truth. And I thank him that he didn't come with truth and grace. Because I would have never got to the grace. The truth would have crushed me. But he comes always with grace. Grace, grace, grace. And truth. Uh, Preston Sprinkle said this, and I think I have this quote. Grace doesn't make demands. It gives. And from our vantage point, it always gives to the wrong person. <laughs> we see this over and over again in the Gospels. Jesus always is always giving to the wrong people. Prostitutes, tax collectors, half-breeds. The most extravagant sinners of Jesus' day receive his most compassionate welcome. Grace is a divine vulgarity that stands caution on its head. It refuses to play it safe and to lay it up. Grace is recklessly generous, uncomfortably promiscuous. It doesn't use sticks and carrots and time cards. It doesn't keep score. If that penetrates our minds, if that penetrates our hearts, then it changes our lives. My punchline today at the end is, is and I'm gonna, I'll repeat it, but you know what we need to do we need to be the same people out there as we are in here. Aren't you, ever ni aren't you really nice to each other in here? And, uh, sometimes it's challenging. I've, uh, I won't mention names. Um, no, we, we, we have to, you know, we just need to Live in this, saturated in this, thinking about this, meditating upon this, you know, allowing it to have its way in us and through us. The truth of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the compassion of God that we, we receive through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't make us any better than anyone else. So if that's the vibe that people are getting, they're getting the wrong vibe. Father Rick, uh, so, so how do we communicate? How are we the communication of God? First and foremost, Father Rick Thomas said this. He said, uh, you can't preach the good news if you're the bad news. <laughs> I never use notes, so I don't know what to do with them. No, you can't preach the goodness if you're the bad news. The second thing is the scripture says to be prepared. Be prepared. Be prepared to give an answer to everyone who that's a pregnant pause meant for you to respond to it. <laughs> asks. You know, be prepared to give a response to everyone who Asks, is there something about us? Is there something about our lives? Is there something about the way that we live? Is there something about the way we handle our money? Is there something about the way we handle our bodies? The, the way we handle our time, time that provokes somebody to ask us, What's, what is this? What is this hope that you have within you? Where does it come from? We need to be prepared to say, It comes from my knowing Jesus, it comes from the gospel putting my trust in God with everything I have, by seeking first the kingdom of God and allowing everything else to sort itself out. So we have to be ready to give an answer. And hopefully we'll be around some people 
that would want to ask that question. If you're, if we're, all we're around is, is fellow churchgoers, um, then nobody's going to ask you that question. The ones who are going to ask those questions are people who don't have that hope within them. So pray that God would expand our, our horizons, expand our areas of influence, open our eyes to what he's doing. And then third, we need to live with a view that the world of the world is influenced by eternity. That's such an important phrase right there, living in, in this life, influenced by eternity, with an eternal perspective on everything that we do. It, it really will change the decisions you make. It really will. But it's, that's why it's tough in our culture, because we have so much pleasure. We have so much that, that scratches our itch. We have so much that, that makes us happy for a while. And, uh, and so we need to push that aside. Uh, fourth, we need to see people as God's creation, as, uh, as babies waiting to be birthed. You know, you know, we're supposed to sow seed generously, you know, on the rocky soil, amongst the thorns, on the roadway. You know, just, we don't know which seed is going to take root. Um, I recently moved uh, to Huntington Beach, and, and one of the absolute most delightful things about it is that uh, I get to meet new people. And, you know, I've been living in Brea and running a room and uh, really not involved in the neighborhood or anything like that. So this move, I'm in an apartment complex with six, six different uh, people. Uh, and, you know, Huntington Beach, you know, the people walk around and all that. So I've met, I've met uh, uh, Charlie, I've met Sarah, I've met Emily, I've met Courtney, I've met Brandon, I've been, met Nate, I've met Grant. And I know, their, I know many of their lives already. I know that um, Courtney, who cuts hair, um, was raised by a mother and never knew her father. Do you think there's a place in her heart for the father's love? Do you think there might be an opportunity for me to be that to her and for her? She cuts hair, and she cuts hair downtown Huntington Beach, and I, I imagine it's probably three, four times more expensive than where I go. It's, it's equally as I don't care about clothes, I don't care about the hair. You know? <laughs> if I get to get cut. <laughs> and, uh, but you know where I'm getting my hair cut? Get my hair cut by, by Courtney. I'm investing in the king. I'm sowing seed. You know, I, I don't know what will happen, but I suspect that there'll be a chance to demonstrate to her and communicate to her about the Father's love for her. Brandon, who's a manager of a business in the area, I've met him, and I saw him last night, and he said, he said hi, Pastor Carl, you know, and, uh, and I said, hi, I didn't tell him I make you call me Archbishop, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, so I, I said, hi, you know, so we're talking about his trip to Costa Rica and all that, and he goes, so what's up for you this week, and I said, well, I'm teaching tomorrow, he goes, where, I said, at, at my church, and he goes, he goes, you know, I'd really like to, I'd really like to come hear you. And he goes, I said, really? He goes, yeah. He goes, I like you. <laughs> and I, I think I'd like to hear you talk. Wow. You know? Right. He's talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> the Grinch. <laughs> I'm purposely not very Grinch, Grinchy out there. Um, but uh, Nate and Grant and all these people I've met, and I, I start, you know, and I'm knowing, I, they don't know a lot about me, but I know a lot about them already. And they're, they're, they're on my radar screen. Amen. I'm making time for them. I'm making space for them. Because they will face difficulties. They will have crisis in their life. And you know who they're going to talk to? They talk to me. They just are. Because they can tell that I like them. And I like them just the way they are. I don't need him to change. I don't need him to do anything different. This uh, Emily's boyfriend, <laughs> Emily, who, whose dad has a brain tumor, and she said she'd like to bring him here to get prayer. Mm. You know, um, and she's a, a fallen away Christian. You know, and uh, but she said she would like to come here and bring her dad. And she said he'll love it. You know, so I'm like, but I met her boyfriend the other day, <laughs> and he he. Had, know anything about me so he's 
the F bomb was flying, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw her yesterday, and she goes, I'm so sorry. And I go, it's all right. Did you tell him I'm a pastor? <laughs> she goes, yes. <laughs> he, wanted, he wished she would have warned him. Um, and, I, and I'm glad she didn't. I don't want him to be anything other than he is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when God gets a hold of him, God starts to transform his life, fine. But I'm not God. I'm just there to be the communication of God to these people. That's what we're about. We're not about all the bells and whistles and making it really cool in here for you. You know, we'd like to play the songs in the same key and the same <laughs> chords at the same time and all that kind of stuff. That's that's not bad. But uh, uh, but we don't. You know, we're not. Gonna, we're just not going to put a light show on for you. We're not going to. You know, we're not going to have special sparkles and stuff for you. i That's fine. That's totally fine for those who want to do it. It's not what we want to do. We just want to create, to develop, to sow into men and women who believe in Jesus and want to follow him in every way, shape, and form. Every way, shape, and form. To follow him. And to, we're supposed to be imitators of Christ and walk in love as dearly loved children. So, if you've got any religion in you, if you've got any disdain in you for, for the lost, for those who aren't in the family yet, find a way, get rid of it. And the best way to get rid of it is, is just expose your heart and your mind to the gospel. Be fully cognizant of all that God has done for you at great, great cost to him and no cost to you or to mine. Amen? Gary? Let's just wait a moment on the Lord, okay? Just... Examine your heart, your mind, your life. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, we just thank you that you revealed Jesus to us. Show us the Son so we can know the Father. So that we don't behave like orphan children. Fill our hearts, Lord, with gratitude, with thanksgiving, with praise, with joy. Take the blinders off. Help us to see people the way that you see people. As we leave this place, Lord, if we go to restaurants or anything, I pray that we'd look at those servers and we'd know that they're, they're your children. That you love them and you died for them. Help us to be a people that make you know. Help us to be the same here as we are there. To take the big smiles on our face and the, the readiness to laugh and enjoy. Take it out from here into our neighborhood, into places we work, into our families.
this is the truth. Gary had no idea what I was preaching. I mean, that's, that's it right there. That's, that's pretty awesome. in us as a people. Lord, that we would see ourselves as a recipient of your grace. And Lord, that we would know that we're your communication in this world. So Lord, let us be carriers of your love and your mercy and your grace and your compassion and your truth, Lord, and your mercy. Give us those opportunities, Lord, to demonstrate who you are and how wonderful you are in the world we live in. Yes. Amen. If you're here today and, and you would like some personal prayer, we have people that pray for people and, and maybe the Lord has spoken to you directly and you just want to that confirm. Maybe you're here today and you're sick of body and you need healing and people that will pray for you. And um, other than that, Bless you. Have a wonderful Christ-filled week. Amen? Amen. There's donut holes that way. Yeah.